Hi guys, Olive here, here today to show you the books that I have picked up recently. Most of these books are incredibly seasonal. They are very appropriate for the fall months, heading into the winter months. There's both fiction and nonfiction in this book haul, and pretty much all of them remind me of that transition to the autumn months, and then also as we're heading into winter. We have some campus novels, we have some grim nonfiction, we have some books that would be appropriate for Victorian October, Victober. There's a little bit of everything. I have so many books to show you, so let's just get right into it. The first thing I would like to show you is the graphic novel version of Clue, which was and still is a board game, but it was also a cult classic movie, which is one of my personal favorite movies. From what I hear about this one, it contains all of the classic characters that you will know and love if you know anything about Clue, but I also hear there are some new faces in here as well. I have seen some mixed reviews of this one, but I was way too curious to pass this one up. This next book I picked up from a bookseller here in Pittsburgh called City Books. Every so often on their Instagram, which I will post down below if you want to check it out, they post pictures of some books that they have in stock. They want to advertise what they have, especially in this era of COVID. It's a good way for them to move some units. But as soon as I saw the picture of this book, I knew I had to snatch it up for my collection of books on Russia. That book is engraved in the memory. This book is a collection of anecdotes from an Englishman who lived and worked in Russia for a big portion of his life. He was eventually the engraver for Catherine the Great. As a fellow outsider looking in on Russia, I will be fascinated to hear what he thought of Russia and what he thought of Catherine the Great. I have one more book on Russia in this haul, and it is called Stalin's Meteorologist, One Man's Untold Story of Love, Life, and Death by Olivier Rolin. First of all, this book has an amazing cover and title. This is the story of a man who was once a celebrated meteorologist in the Soviet Union. But like so many others during Stalin's reign, he was arrested and sent to the Gulag, where he eventually died. This author found out about this man when he uncovered an album full of letters and drawings that this man had sent home to his wife and daughter during his imprisonment and the author decided to tell his story in this book. This next book I picked up because I'm admittedly a little bit stir-crazy and desperate for travel, and one of the places I most want to visit is New Orleans. And so I thought this book would be a good way for me to travel there without actually traveling there. It is Literary New Orleans, edited by Judy Long. This is a collection of stories by writers from New Orleans about New Orleans. At least I can get a taste of the city by reading this book. And then looking at this next book, I'm thinking I probably picked this one up because I've not been inside a museum for such a long time. That book is Seven Days in the Art World by Sarah Thornton. This was written by a former writer for The Economist. And from what I gather about this book, it seems to be a guidebook for the contemporary art worlds. From what I read about this book, it seems like we have certain stops along that tour. So we get to see an MFA critique session, we get to go to an auction, we get to see the behind the scenes goings on of an art prize, we get to go to an art fair, we get to see many different aspects that make up this larger world. Human computer that I am, I do not understand arts, nor do I understand the art world. I don't expect that I ever will fully, but I do think that this book will provide a much needed education for me. Next, I have some campus novels to show you. I have been on the hunt for lesser known but still really good campus novels. I feel like I've read a lot of the big ones already and I have this fear that I'm going to run out of them that I feel is partially inspired by the fact that I have my own campus novel all planned out in my head that's based upon my own college experience. I'm just putting off writing it at the moment. Thankfully for me, I did find a few really good sounding lesser known campus novels that I can feel free to gobble up while I continue to procrastinate writing writing my own novel. The first of that set is Rookery Blues by John Hassler. This book is set in 1969 at a small college in northern Minnesota. Five music students have to decide where their loyalties lie as a teacher's strike takes shape. Another one that takes place in the 1960s is Old School by Tobias Wolf. This one is set where else but at an elite boarding school in New England. We focus on a group of students, which includes our unnamed narrator. 
They call themselves the book drunk boys, meaning that they are obsessed with literature and creative writing. The plot of this book revolves around an annual writing competition and the prize for winning said competition is a private audience with a notorious author. Obviously something very attractive to this group of students. The final campus novel that I picked up is The Starboard Sea by Amber Dermont. This book takes place in 1987 before and after the stock market collapse. In this book we follow a young man who is transferring to a different boarding school in order to complete his final year of high school and also to escape the aftermath of a tragedy at his old school. When he starts at his new school, he meets another troubled student. They share a really deep connection. And meanwhile, reckless behavior abounds because high schoolers. This next one, I guess, could be called Campus Nonfiction. That book is Skull and Keys, The Hidden History of Yale's Secret Societies by David Allen Richards. Yale has been pretty notorious for housing secret societies throughout the history of the university. The most well-known is probably the Skull and Bone Society, which I'm sure inspired this title. Even though a lot of these societies have really bad reputations, the author of this book, who is a Yale alum himself, argues that the 26 secret societies that he discusses within this book have actually also played a role in making the university more progressive and have moved it forward. I'm not sure I'll end up agreeing with everything this author has to say, but I guess we'll find out. However, this book is massive, so when I'm ready to find out, I'll have to set some time aside. <laughs> Moving into some more dark nonfiction, I also picked up The Black Arts by Richard Cavendish. This is a reissue of a 1967 study of the occult written by a British historian. From what I hear about this book, it seems like it's going to be a mixture of fiction and nonfiction, but I'm still definitely intrigued. Up next is Medusa's Gaze and Vampire's Bite, The Science of Monsters by Matt Kaplan. In this book, science writer Matt Kaplan looks at the science behind famous monsters and also looks at the cultures that they were created within. I read a book a few years back on rabies, the cultural history of rabies, and in that book they talked at length about how a lot of the myths and legends about werewolves and vampires might have had their genesis in people's responses to rabies, what they were seeing when an animal or a person got rabies. I looked in the index of this book and rabies is indeed discussed. It will be really cool to see that crossover. As you read more and more nonfiction within a specific category, you see more of that and I think it's really cool. The next dark nonfiction bordering on fiction book that I picked up is Sister of Darkness, The Chronicles of a Modern Exorcist by R.H. Stavis. This is the memoir of a self-proclaimed secular exorcist who says that she has cleansed thousands of tormented people. I suspect I'm going to find a lot, if not most of this, to be complete malarkey, but I couldn't resist it. Apparently at the start of this video, I should have also advertised that in addition to containing campus novels and books for Victober, that this haul also contained questionable nonfiction because this next one is also highly suspect. It is The Mole People, Life in the Tunnels Beneath New York City by Jennifer Toth. This is a book that my friend Steve Donahue talked about in a video he did for Nonfiction November last year. He was giving recommendations for each of the four prompts that we have every year. They're different every single year. And he recommended this book for one of the prompts. It immediately caught my attention. It is supposedly about a population of people who live in the depths below New York City. Steve admits in that video that a lot of this is probably not true, but it seems like it's gonna make for great reading regardless. And then finally, I have a piece of nonfiction to show you that contains some actually credible science. That book is called Blood, An Epic History of Medicine and Commerce by Douglas Starr. Last year, I read a book called Nine Pints, which was mainly about the the modern business of blood transfusions. It included discussions of blood donation and how those donations are transported around cities, that kind of thing. It seems like this book is going to do a similar kind of thing, but it seems like it's going to have more of a historical approach as opposed to public health. Moving into some classics and also classics inspired books, I picked up I, Tichiba, Black Witch of Salem by Marise Conde. Tichiba was a real life historical figure. She was the first woman to be accused of practicing witchcraft in the Salem Witch Trials. She was also a slave whose origins still aren't completely known, although it is suspected that she may have originally come from South America. And also, as you may know, she inspired a character in Arthur Miller's play, The Crucible, but her full story really hasn't been told anywhere. We don't fully know it, and so in this book the author imagines her story as a whole. 
I also finally picked up my own copy of Frankenstein by Mary Shelley, and you'll notice that this is the 1818 uncensored, unedited edition that Mary Shelley wrote when she was a young woman. Most of the popular editions that are going around right now are the edited edition, where Mary Shelley went back years after she wrote the book and heavily revised it. She made a lot of edits. Me picking up this edition specifically was another recommendation from my friend Steve Donahue, who does a whole series of videos on his channel where he goes through his massive collection of Penguin classics and talks a little bit about them. But in the video he did for Frankenstein, he spoke about how superior this original edition is as opposed to the edited version, that this one has a special magic to it that that one just doesn't have. I've never read Frankenstein the whole way through, and I decided if I'm going to start anywhere, it should be at the beginning. I also picked up Tales of Suspense by Edgar Allan Poe. This is a new addition to my collection of these Reader's Digest World's Best Readers editions. So I could have technically included it in my haul of exclusively those editions that I have upcoming, but it fit the theme of this haul so well that I thought I would throw it in here. This is a collection of spooky stories that of course includes things like The Telltale Heart, The Cask of Amontillado, and The Mask of the Red Death. You have to see this opening illustration. That is why I love these editions. <laughs> then I have two more spooky short story collections. The first is Gothic Tales by Elizabeth Gaskell. And the second is The Ghost Stories of Edith Wharton. These are two of my favorite authors, so I definitely want to dip into these. And then with Victober coming up here very soon, I do have some Victorian related fiction and nonfiction to show you. And by that I mean I have an alarming number of books on the Brontes. The first of them I was sent unsolicited by the publisher. It's called Branwell by Douglas A. Martin. This is a novel about the brother of the Bronte sisters. His name was Branwell and he had a number of problems, including some substance abuse issues. I really don't know as much about him as I would like to, especially going into a novel about his life. I would like to know if I'm reading anything that's inaccurate, so I think I might actually pair this one with a biography of some kind. But one I picked up myself is A Girl Walks Into a Book, What the Brontes Taught Me About Life, Love, and Women's Work by Miranda K. Pennington. This is one of those books from this really overly specific subgenre of memoir that I love so much, where the author will write not just about themselves, but about their connection to a specific author or to a specific work of literature. And then they'll also include biographical info about the author. Well, in this case, it's the Brontes, since this author fell in love with Jane Eyre when she was 10. And the final book on the Brontes that I've acquired recently is called The Bronte Cabinet, Three Lives in Nine Objects by Deborah Lutz. Still trying to get this sticker off the cover. This is nonfiction that looks at the lives of the Bronte sisters, but using a slightly different method. The author looks at objects that they owned during their life. So the collar worn by Emily's dog or the walking sticks they used when they would go out walking. She uses that to talk about their lives. It's a really interesting concept, but I will be very interested to read this and see whether or not I find it effective. Another piece of Victorian related nonfiction that I picked up is called Dangerous Days on the Victorian Railways by Terry Deary. This book talks about just how many dangerous things were associated with railways during the Victorian era. I mean, sure, railroads revolutionized industry at the time, but they also caused death, accidents, and disasters. And this book talks about those. Then I picked up a couple of historical fiction novels that take place in the Victorian era. One of those is The Fair Fight by Anna Freeman. This is all about a woman who becomes a boxer. I have heard this book spoken about so much since joining booktube. This one was all the rage around the time when I started my channel, and I've been meaning to read it ever since then. I just never had my own copy but now I do, so I finally need to read it. The final Victorian related book I have to show you in this haul is called A Rumored Fortune by Joanna Davidson Politano. At the beginning of this book, a woman who has just lost her father finds out that his fortune, instead of being in a bank somewhere or tied up in assets, is actually hidden somewhere in their vast estate. After this fact becomes public, opportunists flock to the estate. So the race is on to find the money. I also finally picked up My Cousin Rachel by Daphne du Maurier. I have only ever read one other Daphne du Maurier novel, Rebecca, and I've been meaning to fix that. This seemed like the most obvious choice to move on to next. 
It's all about a mysterious death and a woman who might be responsible. It's definitely Daphne du Maurier's style. I am so excited to read more of her work. Moving toward the end of this haul, I have some autumnal feeling books that I thought I would show you. The first is Hunger Trace by Edward Hogan. Simon from Savage Reads spoke about this book in his own version of fiction, nonfiction pairings. I love those styles of videos so much. He spoke about this book and he said that the main character is a falconer. That was pretty much enough to convince me to pick it up considering that I love birds, specifically birds of prey. Another book I picked up off of a recommendation is At Hawthorne Time by Melissa Harrison. Paul from the book blog Half Man Half Book left me a comment, as he very frequently does, on my nature writing recommendations video. I was speaking in that video about how much I love this author's book All Among the Barley. It is such a good autumnal book too if you're looking for a recommendation. But in the comment section Paul said that he liked that book but that this was his favorite book from Melissa Harrison so I had to pick it up. And this book, lo and behold, has a blurb from Helen MacDonald. It was a done deal. And then at long last, I picked up The Good Good Pig, The Extraordinary Life of Christopher Hogwood by Cy Montgomery. Cy Montgomery has become one of my favorite nonfiction writers. The Soul of an Octopus is one of my favorite nonfiction books. And she wrote about this pet pig she had for a long stretch of time in her collection, How to Be a Good Creature, that I read earlier this year. It was a five-star nonfiction prediction. It ended up earning five stars from me. I absolutely loved it. But in that collection, there was only one essay on Christopher Hogwood, and this is a whole book about him. I cannot wait to read this. As we get closer to the end of the year, we also get closer to my favorite holiday, which is Thanksgiving. And so counterintuitively, I picked up the book Illumination in the Flatwoods, A Season Living Among the Wild Turkey by Joe Hutto. This was written by a naturalist, and it's all about his experience spending a season living among wild turkeys, as the subtitle suggests. I definitely suspect that this book will make me feel less motivated, we'll say less motivated to eat turkey anymore, which I'm honestly fine with. I spent a number of years being a full vegetarian. I'm a semi-vegetarian now. I would like to inch back to being a full vegetarian. It's just a little bit tricky because I have a tomato allergy, which cuts out a lot of food options for me, but I will find a way to figure it out. And then the final two books that I have to show you in this haul, I picked up in anticipation of the winter months, which I know will be here in the Northern Hemisphere before we know it. The first of those two is Nutcracker Nation by Jennifer Fisher. I first heard about this book from Natalie over at Curious Reader. I find the most amazing nonfiction books from her channel. If you are not already subscribed, I highly suggest that you do so. This book is all about North America's love affair with the Nutcracker Ballet. This one seemed perfect to read around Christmas time. And then the final book I have to show you in this haul is called Antarctic Navigation by Elizabeth Arthur. I picked this book up off of a recommendation from the owner of the bookstore I was working at earlier this year, the bookstore I was helping out at earlier this year. He recommended this book to me when he heard that I love nature writing. This is a novel about an expedition to the South Pole led by an American woman. It's actually based on a similar journey that was actually taken by a British explorer. This is definitely a tome, but it seems like it's going to just be perfect to sink into on a cold winter's day. So those are some of the books that I have picked up recently, ones that I think would be perfect for fall or even for early winter. If you have read any of these books, if you've heard of any of them, or if you're now interested in them after seeing them in this video, please do let me know in the comment section below. But if you would like to connect with me somewhere other than YouTube, I am on a variety of different places on social media and the links to all of my my profiles will be in the description box below. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you're having a wonderful day and I will see you in the next video. Bye.